Welcome to Think Like a Dog podcast, where we explore dog behavior and psychology-based training to help your dog achieve their full potential. All right, welcome back to Think Like a Dog podcast. And today we are talking about kids and dogs, a topic that we've been asked to cover many times before, but because there is a lot to cover here, we kind of worked our way down to get to this to this topic because it's, it's a lot of different things that we're going to touch on that we did discuss in the previous episodes. So today we have Joe here with us, and Joe is a mirror image canine trainer. She was on the previous episode and other episodes as well. And she typically works with the puppies and she's been working with a lot of kids and she's gotten a lot of questions, right, Joe? Lately, we were just talking mm-hmm. about about um, people coming up to you and asking you about yeah. what to do. Yeah, it feels like, like <laughs> everyone's getting pregnant lately or has young kids. Um, I've been getting a lot of those. Lately. About what to do when your dog, like when you maybe are having a brand new child and you don't mm-hmm. have any other children, how to prepare your dog for, cause there's so many different, uh, opinions on this. Um, there is the bring home a blanket thing and then have your dog smell the, the blanket. So your dog knows the baby and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of, of information that I think is important to give, yeah. uh, when it comes to preparing your new or your baby or your dog. Oh my gosh. When it comes to (laughs) preparing your dog for a new baby, okay? The first thing is I think it's really important to recognize the goal. We look at it a little bit differently. The goal isn't that your dog loves the baby. The the first goal is that your dog respects the baby. Um, So we don't normally suggest bringing home a blanket um, because I, well, one, your dog can claim something just based on scent, okay? Mm -hmm. Two, I want your dog to understand uh, that when you walk in with your baby, that they need to be respectful, they need to, they need to give distance, all of that, that you almost claim that baby like it is your baby. I tell people, clearly I don't have kids, uh, I tell people, you treat your baby like it's uh, your favorite pizza pizza, right? <laughs> like, like you don't let your dog near the baby the first few weeks, especially, uh, and I've had a lot of um, moms that are planning on getting like C-sections, especially if you've had a C-section, you need space from your yeah. dog because you have, you're recovering from a major surgery. So the first thing isn't walk the baby in, dog right in the baby's face. It's no, you're not allowed near the baby for a little while because as this baby grows and gets into crawling and walking and falling and screaming and all of that, I, I don't want my dog thinking it has a right to control my baby's space or it is entitled to be in my baby's space, especially if I have a large breed dog, especially like how many times do you hear people saying, I don't know if I can keep my dog, not because the dog is being reactive to the baby or intending to harm the baby, but just because the dog is too big and rude with the baby space. Yes. That's why my parents, when I was a baby learning how to walk, they had to give their golden retriever away because she kept knocking me over and I kept hitting my head. And well, that explains a lot now. <laughs> huh. Huh. <laughs> um, but sir, I mean, it happens all the time of they are just rude. They knock my baby over or they jump on my four year old or yeah. whatever it is, or they try to steal food or whatever. And I have to, it's just too much for me to handle that. That happens because from the second you bring your baby home, you don't create any rules around what, what you have to do to be in my baby's space, which is first ask for permission. Can't just walk in, you know, and sit right next to him. And two, you have to be calm and respectful. Yeah. That's huge when it comes to bringing home a baby. Jill, when you're working with puppies and kids, you know, what, like, what is your first step? Like, can you walk us through kind of like a session that you would have with a family kids, puppies, like what are you covering mm-hmm. and what kind of questions are you asking them mm-hmm. to get some more information? Probably the first few questions that I'm asking is what rules and boundaries have you been working on with the puppy? Um, are they crate training? Are they allowed in every room or are they just allowed to run all over the house? Um, and then another big one is um, how how are the interactions between your kid and your puppy going? Is it, you know, your kid's picking up your puppy and running around the house with it, putting the puppy in the stroller and pushing it around the whole door. I've seen that before. (laughs) Um, So that's a big part of it. Because if if those are all the interactions that your kids are having with the puppy, that's not going to create a good relationship as the kid and the puppy grows up. Um, And it also 
you, you have to make sure that you're giving these boundaries to your kids so that you're advocating for your puppy. Um, because a puppy probably doesn't want to be pushed around in a stroller all day. <laughs> no. Um, so that's where you have to kind of, um, become a, a little bit of the bad guy in that situation and give your kid those rules and boundaries. You almost have to like mediate, you right, know, of like, right. you know, you wouldn't like this if you were, you know, if, if the puppy came up or the puppy, you don't like when the puppy comes up and grabs at your hair. So the puppy probably doesn't like when you come up and you pull on their tail. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. I heard in one session, um, it was a young couple and the wife was pregnant. It was a long time ago, but he said to me, uh, he had two large breed dogs. He said, I've been pulling on her tail and I've been messing with the ears and all then like kind of, you know, being a little rude with them just to get them prepared. And I'm like, no matter how many times you slap me in the face, I'm not going to just not react the fifth <laughs> yeah. time. Right. Mm-hmm. There is no getting used to being hit or uh, pulled on. It's about teaching your kid how to be respectful with your puppy. So in, in sessions with younger kids, not babies, obviously, the first thing is making sure that the kid understands the boundaries around the dog. And then yes. also making sure that the dog under, like, understands that there's boundaries around the kid and, and the house in general. It's a two way street. It has to be. We have, I mean, this is such a a topic that I'm so passionate about, especially running a rescue and us going through rescuing these dogs and trying to find a good good home for them. A lot of times we get applications in and it's saying, um, my kid has been wanting a dog for a long time. Like my kid wants a dog. This dog's for my kid. And that already is a red flag for us because you need to understand a dog is not for a kid you know you can't get a a dog for your your kid that still needs to learn so many things in their life and then you're getting this dog and expecting the kid and the dog to be best friends and then for me to be together all day sleeping together and and less it like absolutely like there's I I think there are some people, not everybody, uh, that mean, you know, I want my kid to learn responsibility from Mm -hmm. living with a dog. And I think that that's huge. I think that's owning a dog, um, and, and raising a dog and a kid and making sure that the kid has some sort of responsibility level towards that dog is great for them. Um, but you can't, put it all on them. Like at the end of the day, you are the one getting the dog. So it's your job, not only to advocate for your child and make sure that you are giving them exercises or, um, routines even that they, that are age appropriate, that, that are, um, that are something that they can understand, but also advocating for your dog and making sure that the kid is actually doing these things. Because at the end of the day, you can tell your dog, okay, you have to walk your, or I'm sorry, you can tell your kid, you have to walk the dog for 20 minutes every single day. But at the end of the day, the dog's paying the price. If you are not, if you're not doing that when the kid isn't Mm -hmm. right, like that's not fair. So it's not the dog or it's not the kid's dog it's your dog with kids too and dogs like are, how is your kid going to walk the dog how are you creating how is your kid and the dog creating that relationship going back to getting a dog for your kid is your kid already in a place where yes learning responsibilities take care of our dog is great but are they really following through with all the other responsibilities they have that's true i don't know you how know. to raise kids <laughs> i'm going to be listening to other people's podcasts yes. when that happens for us but um, I just hear this story so many times, like cinnamon and dog that we have now came to us because her, the, the previous family the mom got cinnamon for the daughter. The daughter's about 12 years old. Daughter obviously was not doing anything to help cinnamon, you know, no cinnamon was just going crazy, eating things, chewing on things, anything that fell on the floor, she would chew on. Eventually the mom said, this is too much. Obviously the little girl still wanted her, but mom couldn't handle all that intensity plus cinnamon as a puppy chewing through everything. So dogs and kids, like it, a dog is an animal that you're going to have to advocate for. You're going to, you're going to have to set rules for you. It's basically, you're going to raise two kids at this point. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like, (laughs) you're you're just getting an extra kid. When you're getting a dog for your kid, you are, it's I think people look at it as like, oh, well, my kid's going to help me out. They'll take him out. They'll do this. But you are doubling the work of if you just had a child or you just had a, a had a dog because you are yeah. also make, have to, having to make sure that the kid isn't exciting the dog, that the kid isn't creating negative patterns. Exactly like what you said. How are they walking it? Because then it, it, let's say the kid is walking the dog for 20 minutes every single day, but it's at the end of the leash. Now this dog's a year old. It's a lab and it's pulling them into traffic. It's, you know, getting in fights with other dogs in the neighborhood. So it's, it's not as simple as this 
dog belongs to my child and therefore they are responsible. It is, this is our family dog. And I would like to find, I actually had a client that said this, I would like to find exercises that can, that my, my child can do with my dog in order to bond, in order to learn responsibility, because that child was looking for that of like, yes. how can I get involved? But I want to make, they wanted to make sure that how they got the kid involved was safe and, and productive, which is huge, especially for me to hear as a trainer. What are like exercises that do you have like typical go-to exercises you would recommend for kids and dogs? I really like obedience commands I love that <laughs> with kids, because, with kids and dogs, because kids love it. Um, and it's something that's not like super hard for the dog to pick up on. Um, and it's also not dangerous. It's not like the dog is going to like pull your kid into traffic on a walk or anything that I, I'm kind of wary about kids taking dogs for walks Absolutely. on their own <laughs> um, until they're at least like a certain age. Um, but I like having the kids work on thresholds, like door thresholds or crate thresholds with the dog. Um, usually those are easy depending on age. Um, same thing with like walking downstairs slowly. Um, but depending on how your dog does with these things, you might want to work on some of this first and then kind of include your kid in the exercise. Yeah, there's so many factors of like yeah. the size of the dog and the size of the child, yeah. right? Like you don't want your, even if you're six month old Mastiff puppy and you have a four year old, if that dog decides to go and your four year old's not letting go of that leash, you're at a four year old kind of going down <laughs> the stairs. So it's a making sure that you're playing or you're looking at the whole picture of um, what is the dog capable of? Let me try this exercise with my dog first. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll teach my kid how to do yes. it. But I love doing obedience stuff with kids mm -hmm. and dogs. I also love doing, um, uh, I think this was actually your game, but like the claim your space game. Mm -hmm. So putting tape on the floor, that's a super productive exercise. So you kind of, you tape a square on your floor, have your child sit in the middle of it and they use spatial pressure to tell their dog to go. And then when it, whenever their dog kind of chills out on the other side of that square, then you call them in and you practice recall coming back to me that's and awesome. then leaving. That's one of my favorite games to play. And how fun would that be? Like when a kid right. and you, when you get, a, a dog and a kid to interact that way respectfully your your kid is learning how to do these drills they're learning responsibility they're learning respect they're being more aware of their body language of their space how awesome is that that you're teaching your kid to respect space to respect other people's space other animal space and you're giving them a task to do and you're helping it's them kind of follow through with that huge i mean in that one exercise alone not only is the kid learning how to respect other you know, species and in, in, in the space of another human or another dog, the kid is also learning that their space should be respected. They are worthy yes. of having their space respected. They are also learning about their own body language and what it, what it communicates to another animal and, and potentially to another human. They are learning that when they're kind of like, and I get this a lot when they're joking and they're silly, the dog's not going to take them seriously. Yeah. If they're too rough, the dog's going to get angry. Like they're learning so much about more than just dog training. But I think people get a, dog for their kid because they want them to play together and then that's where we get things like well the dog's nipping or mouthing or mm -hmm. jumping and they're scratching all over the legs and stuff like that but if you look at exercises that are productive you can actually be teaching super positive lessons on either side but the first step is not getting a dog for your correct kid. it's getting a dog as a family member mm -hmm. and now you are adding this dog into your family everybody's gonna have to communicate everybody's gonna have to pitch in we talked about that in our um bringing home a new dog episode of like yeah. making sure everybody in the house is on the same page kind of going through and saying okay this would be your responsibility this would be your responsibility and if you're not sure if your child can handle that find a friend's dog and ask if they can stay for the weekend and you know yeah. see if there's like you can do trial runs that's what i used to do my parents didn't get me a dog they refused until i was like <laughs> 10 or 12 years old i feel like but it was a matter of I would knock on all my neighbor's doors and ask to walk their dog. And as soon as I did that, like consistently, they, they realized, okay, she is going to put the work in. She is going to let the dog out. If I get, you know, home early and things like that, it's, she's going to be yes. responsible enough for this, but it is okay to say, um, to make sure that your child is responsible enough before getting the dog. It is not okay to use the dog as a way to teach an irresponsible child responsibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's huge. And Joe, can you tell us some of the issues that you notice with kids and dogs that walk into the center and doing a session with you? What are some of the things that you notice was kind of built up because that relationship wasn't established between a kid and a dog and vice yeah. versa? 
something that I feel like I hear all the time um, is the family will have two kids and there's always that one kid that gets picked on way more by the dog. And the first thing I usually ask is, okay, like what's the difference between how both of these kids act with the dog or even just both of them and how their personalities differ. And like 99% of the time, the kid that gets picked on more by the dog is the more wild kid, the one that runs around the house all the time, amps the dog up. Um, and or the so, more shy one that's scared of the dog. Right, and when the right. dog gets near him, they run away. Exactly, uh. exactly. Um, so those are the cases where having certain exercises that you can involve the kids in with the dog, um, are going to be really, really beneficial. And what are some of those exercises? Like what would be Mm -hmm. the first one that you're telling a family that has this issue work on this? I really like place, um, because then it kind of gives you and your kid a way to turn the dog off. Um, and also practicing like turning on and off intensity in a safe way. Um, so I've done before with like a little bit older kids, not like baby babies, um, but like speed walking around the house. And once the dog starts to get a little amped up, then they move into the dog um, or ask the dog to go to place. And I always use a leash for exercises like that. And I make sure the parents are right there just in case I'm all about like being safe in sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's yeah. also a really great way to wear the kids out. Yeah. So I've done that in <laughs> sessions where I'm like, okay, run around the house. <laughs> yeah. And then when the dog starts jumping on you, your job is to stop. And then whoever, you know, out of two kids, you just, you know, whoever says this color first gets to be the one that moves into the dog or puts the dog on place. You can make it a game. That's a huge, huge thing for kids is that I make everything a game when it comes to the dog, especially when you have two kids in the house. It's all about, you know, who can get the dog to move to, um, you know, move out of their space quicker, who, you know, who can do this better down the stairs, like speed walking or leash walking down the stairs. Um, but it's, it's really a matter of making sure that you are taking the problem area and breaking it down into truly kid sized pieces that it's productive. And then also what you said, prevention. So in the times where you can't be watching and making sure that that game is going the way that you want it to, your dog is in the crate or Mm -hmm. your kids are, you know, out of the house or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're not putting the, either your child or your dog in a situation where this incident will happen without being intentional. So you are able to work through it. We all see it numerous and numerous of stories on social media in real life that you, it just makes you, your heart hurt, you know, for the family, for the dog. Um, and I feel like a lot of families, they live with behaviors and they just let it slide or they just, they try to get through it. I was at the vet the other day and I was in the treatment room and I just hear the commotion outside. Mm -hmm. And it was a little kid, a little girl. She sounded very young, um, but she was speaking a lot. So I'm thinking she's probably like seven years old or so. And they had like a, I only know it was a Doberman because my mom told me she was in the car just kind of watching it play (laughs) out. all the information. (laughs) Because I couldn't see it outside the door, but I just heard it. And the dog is reactive like towards everything. Like Mm -hmm. it's pulling on the leash. You can hear it like sliding on the floor. You can hear the dog like barking and jumping and being super crazy and wild. And the little girl is just like, my dog is very hyper. My dog has a lot of energy. Um, I don't know why she's this way. I don't know why. And she's just talking and talking and talking and talking. And the, the mom is just like, you could, I don't even hear the mom's voice. I like, bet she, yeah, I bet she I was done even, talking. I don't hear the mom at all. I just hear the little girl. But why do you think my telling the doctor, why do you think my dog acts this way? But why is she like this? And they're just going on and she's just going on and she's just, her dog is going wild. <laughs> And the little girl is just talking like, but why, but why is she doing this? Like, why is my dog like this? I know she's hyper, but why is she like this? That is, that was kind of sad for me to hear. Cause I know this little girl probably loves this dog and like has such a big love for animals. Um, cause she, she just couldn't understand why was her dog like that? Why was her mom so frustrated? Why was the staff so frustrated with her dog? Like, why does this have to be my dog? But at home, she's not like this. And as soon as we get out, she's wild, yeah. you know, why do we have to deal with this? Why is my dog this way? That is when you have your kid go through that and you're not stepping in and say, you know what? We don't have to live this way. Let's figure it out. Let's look for help. You know, we don't have to get rid of the dog. It's not the dog that's the problem. Let's work this out. We also don't have to live in this. Yeah. And how, how 
like really scarring it is for you as a kid to not have your dog anymore and like your dog just go away. Like we never forget yeah. that. Oh my God. Like I once, never, yeah. once you, once you have that dog in your life and then they get rehomed, you you always have that dog in your mind, but you don't understand as a kid why that happened, why the dog went away, you know, how, why, how can you just take a right. dog out of your life and rehome it like that? Like kids don't understand that. Yeah. So as a parent, you, you have to look for help and getting your a help from a trainer that understands behavior. Don't go for a trainer that's just going to uh, teach obedience and then say, okay, this should fix your dog's reactivity or your dog's lack of um, awareness for space. And you guys are just going to tell the dog to sit and down all day. That's fun for you to do, but like psychology based trainers that really understand the dog's body language and their behavior patterns, right. they're well, going to sit like, and talk to you about more in depth about this. what Jill was saying about the obedience. It's great for kids and uh, kids to do with dogs because it practices the kids giving direction to the dogs. But if you only did that and there wasn't, um, the, a parent they're supervising and making sure that, yeah. you know, they're looking for little body language signs that show that the dog is stressed, which we need to absolutely mention this. There are, uh, that's where we, that's why we teach place. That's why we teach the crate. And when it comes to kids in the house, we make very, very clear when the dog is on this space, they are not to be touched. Mm -hmm. When they are in the crate, you're not sticking your fingers in the crate. You're not crawling in the crate with them. People send me pictures like that. I'm like, that's not cute. Like mm -hmm. you went, you put your dog and your kid in a situation where there's now a limited amount of space and your dog looks stressed, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you one need to know your dog. You need to make sure that you are not putting your dog in a situation with your child that could potentially, um, that you're not there to, to watch for these, these signs because you don't get to decide what stresses your dog out. We've said that in almost every single episode we've done. You are not, uh, you don't get to decide how your dog feels about things. You do get to decide how they respond to those things. But if what your dog is doing in those moments is okay, you know, the kid is laying on top of me and I maybe give a growl, but nobody's around to, to tell the child to back off of me. And this, this, you know, the child doesn't know that growling means to back off or doesn't hear me because they're yeah. playing a game or whatever it is. Um, then my only other option maybe, yeah, for a very tolerant dog is going to be to get up and move and try to create space if you're not around, what if the kid follows, right? The kid follows, wants to be in cuddle with the dog. And then the only other option there is to bite. So we, we sort of, I mean, we talk about this all the time. There's never a moment where it's like, you don't, people who say that the dog just did it out of the blue. It never happens out of the blue. Dogs do not bite out of the blue. There are, um, there are ladders and of, like a sort of intensity and there are other ways that they will attempt to cope with the situation because they are not, uh, animals who like confrontation. And if they, if it was fun for them to bite, they wouldn't be a species. They'd be mm -hmm. fighting everybody. They would have killed each other. It's just not, um, productive for them. So there are, they are going to do little signs and, and they're not, they might be subtle to us as humans, but they're going to do things like go from an open mouth to a closed mouth. They're going to do things like, um, get really tense and still they're going to do things like give a growl or yawn or lick, uh, lick their lips a lot. And then you're going to see a dog try to get up and create space. And if that doesn't work, and let's say this dog is super tolerant and tries that a bunch of times, if that doesn't work, what else can the dog do? What are you going to just ask your dog to sit there and take it the whole time? If for something that they don't like, that's not fair. Mm -mm. That's not fair. Yeah. And that's why it's so, so important to be aware of all of these different body language signs, whether you get that from a trainer or, um, you know, online watching YouTube videos. Um, and then even, you know, teaching your child the same, same things, um, just on a lower level. Like if, you know, you could tell your kid, if you're petting your dog and they start to walk away or they close their mouth or start licking their lips and you stop petting the dog and, you know, you walk away. Or um, even for that, one of my favorite rules, cause some kids can't, depending on the age, some kids can't mm -hmm. understand body language or right. they're just not going to focus on that. They're right. going to be playing a game on their iPad while petting their dogs. I ha I love doing the rule of you get 10 seconds. You can put your hands on the dog for 10 seconds mm -hmm. and then you have to you have to stop petting 
put your hands in your lap and see what the dog does. Mm -hmm. Does the dog stay there? Then you can go and pet again for Mm -hmm. 10 more seconds. Does the dog get up to move? Does the dog come back into you more? And I explain it to the child as it's a conversation that you're having. So, you know, you say your part, but then let the dog say their part back. So 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off. But in those moments where your dog is stressed, it's up to you as the parent, which is why we, we really don't like when people say that they got the, the dog for the kid. It's up to you to advocate for your dog and your child in that moment and send your dog or your dog to, to place or the crate somewhere where they know, okay, I can go here and nothing happens to me because my mom is going to advocate for me and make sure that this toddler isn't coming up to me on place and pulling at my tail. It is absolutely up to the adults in the household to make sure that that situation goes well. And that'll also take a strain on you and your dog's relationship if you're not advocating for them in those situations. If your kid's sitting there yanking on their tail and you're just standing by not making any decisions for your dog um, and for your kid, then your dog's going to have to take that upon themselves to defend themselves (laughs) in this situation. Yeah, I mean, they're learning something about you too because you're not there saying, hey, excuse, you know, move away from my, you know, from the dog, please. You're being rude. You're also yeah. teaching your kid that it's okay to be rude with other, uh, animal space and, uh, to not read the response from a, another being. I think that that's important just as a lesson, uh, as a, to raise a good human, but mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. Your dog is learning from you that, okay, mom is clearly not helping me out in this situation because uh, I'll say it again. You don't get to decide what stresses your dog out. But if the, your dog is stressed and you're not there helping them through it, then that's that's where you lose points. That's where you don't get to decide how they deal with it because you're not helping them through it. And it's not cute to get pictures and videos and whatever of your dogs and your kids all over each other. And I absolutely hate to see videos on so- social media of like the parent trying to go for the kid and the dog jumping on the parent. Like, look, they're protecting my kid. Mm-hmm. If anybody yeah. messes with my kid... My dog is here to protect. That's not your dog's job. They are not right. doing it in that way. That's not their mentality. They are not protecting your kid. Well, and chances they are, are they are claiming. They're I mean, claiming, yeah. but in a bad way. You know, just like your you don't get a dog for your child. Your child isn't your dog's. You know yeah. what I mean? Nobody belongs to anybody but you. Here, you are responsible for all of it. Now, all of this to say, I do one of my favorite sessions ever is when a family walks in. I love working with kids and dogs because most of the time kids get it a little quicker than the, than adults. They just, it's simple in their minds. They don't overthink it. They don't assume that the dog, um, exists for them. Like a lot of uh, adults do, right. That the dog should just be there to, you know, fix their emotional, uh, trauma and things like that. It's the, the kids are just really simple about it. It's, I, I just, I love working with, uh, teaching a kid how to communicate with another species and, uh, how, what they do affects the response that they get from, from the world around them, whether yes. that's through, uh, their dog or, you know, their sister or their brother, or when you guys play, look at what happens. Because I think as much as dogs teach, can teach kids responsibility, it also can teach kids how to know that that you matter, right? Like what you do and what you say matters and can get a different response. So you can change it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, you do something and then your mom comes in and, you know, puts the dog up because the dog is freaking out and you get to continue doing what you want. It's look, okay, because you are screaming, the dog is now jumping on you. When you stop screaming, then the dog will stop jumping on you. You are in control Mm -hmm. of the world that, of, of the responses that you get from the world around you. And I think that that's the biggest lesson. And I also love teaching kids that they can be powerful through that. Yeah. And with kids and dogs and, you know, parents and everybody involved, you really have to learn how to advocate for your dog and you can give your kid fun things to do with your dog, but that should be more of a fun, you know, fun drills or fun obedience commands. Like that should be something supervised and fun, but still you have to advocate for both parties involved, the kids and the dog. Be productive more productive. than fun. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Productive. Yeah. And with, you know, with larger breeds, they have such small, small space. They, they, really, they have no space for mistakes. Like really, if a dog yeah. that's a larger breed growls or tries to bite or does bite, that's it for that dog, especially if they're going for a kid. 
And we have so many stories everywhere all the time. And pit bulls is the top of the headline because people love to throw that breed out there and say they're the, they're the problem. They're not the problem. If you have a dog, especially a pit bull breed, and you've had them your whole entire life, and all of the sudden your dog attacks the kid, it was not all of the sudden. If you prepared properly, if you had the right help, if you had really, you know, taken the right steps to advocate for your dog, for your kid, for your kids to, to know what space is, or to really, if it's a little baby and they're crawling yeah. mm-hmm. and you're teaching your dog to be in the crate and calm in the crate while your kid has free range of the, of the living room, that's not going to happen. Don't put a 60, 70 pound power breed with a little toddler and then your power breed is on the bed. It's on the couch. It's known no real boundaries their whole life. And you're not in the same room. You're bringing the baby's blanket home. You're teaching your dog to resource guard or claim your kid because you want them to be used to the kid. The kid's laying on the dog. The kid is using the dog as a pillow. And then the kid is sitting there and you say your dog just bit out of nowhere. It was not out of nowhere. There's always a trigger there that you have not noticed. And, and sometimes it can be super subtle. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Like mm-hmm. it, it can be super, super subtle body language signs, but it is up to you as the parent to educate yourself on those things. Not just for your dog's sake, but for especially for your child's sake. You yeah. have to know what those body language signs look like. There's an Instagram page called Dog Meets Baby. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite pages. And she does body language quizzes uh, on her stories of, um, of dogs and children interacting and asking, okay, uh, is this dog stressed in this moment? Um, you know, what are the signs that you saw that, that, um, that indicate stress or don't indicate stress? And she has like multiple choice sort of little quizzes. So that's a huge page that I always recommend to, Mm -hmm. um, new parents, especially, but I think good. Sorry. No, you're good. (laughs) Before I forget, I just think that this was such a a awesome thing that you mentioned because it really allowed you to see, the way dogs think. But in a previous episode, you said that you had two dogs that they were working on place and one of the place boards were closer, like not Mm. necessarily closer, but let's say the owner was sitting to the left and then one of the dog's place boards was to the left. The other one was to the right. So one was technically closer to the owner. And that one that was, it wasn't like visual, like you would really say, if you just looked at the, you know, the whole picture, you're not really like they're on place, but you know, she wasn't petting them. She wasn't engaging. Just one was closer. So the one that was closer was being reactive. Oh yeah. It would be what they would say. All of a sudden fights of a huge great Dane and a huge great Pyrenees on place. So it was big fights. And they were on place. She was trying to put them on all of a sudden mentality, dog's mentality. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's kind of one of my favorite things to do is like almost be like a detective in the session of like, okay, um, yeah, based on, you know, the phone consult, you sound like you're doing everything right. Based on the text message, it sounds right. But when I walk into your house and I see where the placement is of these place boards, and I know for a fact that I sit in the same spot on my couch, most people probably have like their spots. I ask, okay, well, our issue with the Great Dane was claiming mom. Um, Where do you sit? And it was right here, right? It was like they were right next to each other. And then the great Pyrenees was further away. So of course she was, you know, the, the dog was going and, and it sounded all of a sudden it seemed cause they were just watching TV. Both yeah. dogs were on place, but it was that dog saying, okay, I'm closer. I'm close. I'm in her mm. space more than you are. So it's really, it can be crazy subtle, but that's where it is your job to educate, to not live there, right? Not just work your life around reactivity or an issue between your kid and your dog, find a trainer, um, find more information out there to get yourself out of that situation. So the subtle things don't seem so subtle and you can communicate with a a member of your household better at the end of the day. Like who doesn't you live with them? Don't you want to learn how to communicate with them? Like advocating for your dog. Let's say you bring, um, a new dog home. You just adopted a dog. How, what, what would be some things, Joe, that you would tell like a new client that's just adopted a dog. They have some, you know, a little bit older kids, kids that you can really talk to and they would mm-hmm. understand. What are some things that you'd say, this is how we're going to advocate for this dog's space and allow them to decompress. And this is the rules we're going to lay down mm-hmm. for everybody to follow. 
Yeah, so kind of what we touched on earlier, um, I for sure want to make sure that that dog has at least um, three safe spots, crate, the place, and by my side. Um, so I want to make sure that when the dog is in the crate, there's no fingers being, um, you know, put in there. Same thing with place. The kids aren't all over the dog on place or petting the dog, anything like that. Um, and then another thing that I kind of find I hear a lot is, um, issues around food. Like the kids Mm -hmm. will be putting their hands in the food, especially younger kids, you know, they want to get into everything. Um, so making sure that your dog is fed either, I mean, ideally in the crate, (laughs) I like feeding in the crate a lot. Um, so then your dog has that space that your kids understand that they can't mess with the dog, um, when they're there and they can eat their food, not have to worry about any competition of the kid coming over and taking any of it. Um, yeah, those are a a few things. And how would you, um, in a different side of things too, I think if we can put some things into some bullet points, Mm -hmm. preparing a dog for a kid. Mm -hmm. So in another way around, like you have your dog, how are you preparing them for your new baby or the little kids that are coming to visit? You have lots of kids in your family. I know they're kind of different ways that you do it, but how yeah. would you prepare your dog for that um, interaction so, with a new baby or kids in general? Yeah, setting boundaries with furniture, space, uh, rooms like the nursery, um, crate trained, place trained, um, recall <laughs> is yeah. a good one, just like what we talked about in the last episode. Um, what about you? I think for me, one of the thing I say to all my clients is by the time you bring that baby home, the only thing that should be different in your dog's day to day is the actual baby. Mm-hmm. So, um, I've got a couple, like you said at the very beginning, everybody's pregnant now. Yeah. Um, so I've got a couple clients right now that are preparing their dog for a brand new baby. And I'm looking at, is your dog sleeping in the, in your bed? Even mm-hmm. if your dog is in the crate in the bedroom, right. I want to get that dog out of the bedroom because you're going to be up all night. You're going to be up all night and your dog doesn't have to be. Yeah. And I want to make sure that your dog is given kind of space to relax and know that when the baby cries in the middle of the night, it's not their job to get up and come with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm looking at things like that. I'm looking at how are they responding to the toys because baby toys can be a little bit confusing for dogs, either scary or they could also look like dog toys. Mm -hmm. So I'm creating expectations and information around this is a dog toy that is yours. And this is a a child's toy that is not yours because at the end of the day, kids are going to leave their stuff out. So it's important to make sure that you are, um, giving information to the dog of, Yes, you can chew on this. Please do not chew on this. Um, But one of my big things, and you already said it, I don't allow the dog in the kid's room at all, right? Because they leave stuff out. There are diapers in there. And Mm -hmm. if your dog eats a diaper, that's gross because it happens a lot. (laughs) Um, There are little baby socks that they can, that they can eat and get and cause an obstruction. And then you have a $3,000 surgery that you have to pay for on top of when your kid is having a temper tantrum. You don't want your dog to feel stressed about that. You want your dog to go, okay, that's not my responsibility. I can just exit and not be involved in this. But all, oh, and practice walking with the stroller. Your neighbors are going to think you are insane (laughs) because you're going to be walking with no baby in that stroller, but practice before, because the last thing that you want to do is have an actual baby in that stroller and a large breed dog on your leash, on on the leash, and then be trying to walk both. Mm -hmm. Um, that the only thing that should be different by the time that you get there or the baby gets there is the actual baby. I think like we're, everything leads back to boundaries, to crate, to place, and to, you know, really communicating with your dog rules and boundaries throughout their everyday life. Mm -hmm. That's going to translate into a happier life with your dog and your kids and your, your, you know, maybe your nephews and nieces that are coming over. If your dog is aware of that and they know recall and they, they're really solid and all these different things that we always talk about, then they can have a little bit more freedom. If not, don't risk it. Well, and it's right? when you first bring the baby home, don't risk it anyway. Because yeah. if you, especially if you are a new parent, I can't imagine, but your brain and your body are probably going through so 
much, there's no reason to add risk between your dog and your baby in that moment. So recover, get on a routine, have your husband take care of the the dog for you for a little while, Mm -hmm. um, spend separate time with your dog so you can make sure that, you know, you are still able to have that relationship with them. But don't make that your first priority when you get the baby home that the dog and the baby has to be best friends because they don't, right? I think um, just to cover one thing I hear a lot, you don't need to place the sound of babies crying, you know, to get your dog comfortable with them. Um, I literally just had a session less than a week ago for a new mom um, preparing their dog for a baby, Maxwell. Um, Yeah, so we did things like, um, can I sit on the floor? And you are not, that doesn't immediately mean come into my space because you're going to be on the floor with your baby. Um, you know, we did place work with that, but we also proved that when he wasn't on place, if you come in from the out, you know, from the backyard and you see me seated on the ground, do you immediately assume that you can come in my space? Because if there's a little newborn next to me, that's going to be a huge issue. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's a matter of pretending like you have that baby with you in your arms attached to you in every interaction that you have with your dog for a few months before the baby comes. And a lot of the interactions people have with their dogs on a day to day, if you think, could I do this while holding a baby? Most of the time you're going to say no. Yeah. So that change those before. Sense. Don't, mm-hmm. don't wait till you have the baby. You're going to be exhausted. And it's also, you're, it's not fair for your dog to just expect a, you know, okay, all of a sudden everything changes, change it before. Yeah. Right. And the more structure that you have throughout the day with your dog, the easier it's going to be to notice these subtle body language mm-hmm. signs um, that your dog is having. Because if you're, you know, just letting your dog roam around the house and you've got your kid crawling around on the ground, you don't know what your dog's doing over behind the couch. You know, yeah. you don't know anything. That is yeah. so true. Cause with, with Maxwell, he's one of our clients and they are, um, the owners are insanely good with yeah. this dog. We talked yeah. to them. He is, Maxwell's a tough dog. So, uh, and the owners know that he was rehomed a couple times before they got him. Mm-hmm. He does not have any time in that house already mm-hmm. that he is not supervised because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Mm-hmm. Preparing him for a new baby, I told them on Wednesday, I would be very worried if it was anybody but you guys, but because they are so structured with him, I know they're going to notice subtle things. Mm -hmm. I know that they're going to be preventative. I know because they've been practicing it for the entire time that they've owned Maxwell. And Joe, can you tell us like a little bit more about body language? Like just like one of the go more in depth about what to look for, you know, Mm -hmm. the yawns, the licking the lips, the year years, Mm -hmm. you know, how does forehead wrinkles? Yeah. Yeah. That's a big one I see, especially with like pities. Um, you'll kind of see their forehead scrunch up and they'll get all these wrinkles. Um, and that's usually a big indicator of, um, stress, um, with their ears. You sometimes will see their ears go back. Um, when they're stressed out or anxious, you'll see a lot of lick, uh, lip licking, yawning, um, sometimes whining, pacing. Whale eye. Yeah, whale eyes. That's a big one. Whale eye. Yeah. So it's it's when their eyes kind of like open so wide that you can see a lot of the white of their eyes. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it kind of it looks like a whale eye. It almost. looks like that's... they're like very surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what about their tail? I know stiff mm-hmm. stiffness in the tail is a big red flag, but. Isn't there like the way that it's move wagging yeah. too is a red flag yeah. in some different cases? How would that be? Yeah. And that's something I see too, just like on Instagram and TikTok, like the kid will be messing with the dog and they're wagging their tail. So the owner or the people in the comments assume, oh, the dog loves that. The dog's super excited. But in reality, you know, even though that tail's wagging, the dog is licking their lips, their ears are back. You kind of have to look at the whole picture. Mm. Um, tail wagging does not always mean they're happy. And one of the things, too, that you mentioned, Millie, is the kicking back. I call them the mm-hmm. little ballerina feet. <laughs> well, that's what they're called now. Yeah, um, you would have you sent me a video of uh, Bubbles doing that around a new newer dog to him, right? Yes. So little that, dog. yeah, that's normally a dominance thing. That's a dog trying to spread their scent. I don't let dogs do that. Um, you know, we get one dog, Thunder, does that all the time in day <laughs> camp. Um, and we will always stop that. I always interrupt that, especially if they are in a situation around new dogs, new, new children, new humans, um, or in a new environment. Now I will let Kemper do that in my own backyard, okay. but that is it. It's normally kind of like this, Hey, look at me. I'm hot stuff. Kind <laughs> Thing. And it's just not something that 
should be allowed when your dog is in an environment that they are, uh, they, that they should be looking to you in. Mm-hmm. Something that I um, just watched a video on actually by the account Dog Meets Baby. Um, it was a bunch of different clips put together of um, dogs covering up the baby with a blanket mm. and mm-hmm. them thinking, oh, that. the dog's tucking the baby in. But really, it's something called like food catching. Yeah. Um, and it's where they're trying to like bury and protect and hide their food. Dogs um, will do that for boarding too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not something that you want your dog doing to your baby. That's not, again, not their job at all. So in the veterinary field, we used to, Jill and I worked together uh, at a clinic and um, there was boarding there and we used to see commonly something called kennel nose Mm -hmm. and that's where the dog would be using their blanket to sort of bury their food or something like that and then when we would tell the owners the owners would go well they never do that at home but it was an only dog a lot of dogs eat really well for their owners at home but then when you put them in an environment where they can hear and be around other dogs they're going to try to like almost bury their food and um and claim their food and save it for later and normally they'll eat when it's quiet at night but Mm -hmm. um it is definitely not something you want your dog doing to your baby at all it's not cute yeah it's like their instincts right like you have to play into their instincts their natural instincts of dogs um what does that mean it could be the sweetest, nicest dog, and you think your dog is just the best, and it's At never done. Day, it's still their, it's their still dogs. An animal. It's yeah. still an animal. And you have to respect them for who they are. You don't want anybody else treating you like a, a, you know, a being that you're not. You right. want to be treated like a human being. Um, you don't want to be treated differently. So treat your dog as a dog. Respect their space. Read their body language. And don't think because it's your dog, it's going to be different. Yeah. Oh, that's my dog. It, it, he's not like that. So he's not covering. He's actually covering my baby. Yeah. No, yeah. It, your dog's a dog yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, so with kids and, and dogs, it's just the parents have to be very involved. Their adults have to be very, very involved. Please don't get a dog for your kid. And don't think, don't go on TikTok and Instagram and think, okay, let me play the baby crying. Let me give a blanket. Let me have them smell the baby. I forgot about that. The only reason I said that was because if you do that, what you're, what you're working on, it wouldn't be an awful thing to do it, but what you are trying to work on is not to desensitize your dog to the sound of your baby crying or a baby crying. It's noticing do they get stressed? So if you sound like, if you play the sound of like little baby puppies, a lot of dogs will perk up. Um, Mm -hmm. and and what you are really working on in that moment is how you respond to your dog's stress. So Mm -hmm. you could play the sound of little baby puppies or babies crying or fire, like fireworks probably wouldn't matter unless it's super loud on your (laughs) like stereo system. But it's what you're practicing there. Isn't just like sitting back and playing the sound and watching your dog. You are looking at your dog and you're saying, okay, that was a sign of stress. Now let me send my dog to place. Mm -hmm. Let me show my dog how to move out of my space in this moment. So if you are going to do that, practice how you respond to that. Don't expect the the stress response to change if you're not changing it for them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I've seen some training tactics where they'll, um, like play baby noises or hold a baby or something in their feeding their super nervous dog treats. And what that's doing is just totally rewarding that scared mindset. Or even if it's, even let's say that the dog eventually becomes really used to the baby. Now the baby equals excitement because food equals excitement. And now we have a dog who's disrespectful around the baby because we never taught to be respectful around food in the first place. It's, it's all about calm, respect, neutrality, and showing your dog that you are the one that is responsible for uh, their safety and your child's safety. And you are going to advocate for both, which means only other thing that we haven't mentioned is putting yourself position wise in the middle of you and your, your, your dog and your baby, always making sure you are in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be sitting on the floor, making sure that you are the one that is advocating at both ends. Mm -hmm. We have some questions that we can get through real quick because we did cover a lot already. Um, but this one, just some of the questions that were dropped in our social media question box, usually these question boxes go up a few days before we actually record. So if you would like to drop some boxes on uh, some boxes, drop some, some boxes, <laughs> if you would like to catch the, the boxes that we drop on social media for questions, just follow us at think like a dog podcast on Instagram. So this one says, why is my reactive dog? fine with kids and not adults. Kirsten Messenger. That's a big question. 
The question <laughs> boxes are always very like, well, I have more questions before I can answer your question. Yeah. Um, it, I guess it depends, right? So what age kid is what I would be um, asking? Are these kids that your dog knows already? Or is it, um, you know, kids that are just walking up to your dog in the street and petting them? I, I think for a lot of dogs, kids are um, more often than not a little bit harder for the dog to take because they're mm-hmm. a little bit erratic. There's a lot of chaos involving kids, but then there are some dogs that really enjoy kids uh, and maybe don't like being around adults as much because kids are fun. They are excitement. They normally have food on their face. Um, so it could be um, the energy of the, of a child being just carefree as well. And, and with adults, that's not always the case. Yeah. And with this other question too, I'm just going through it. Um, this one here is how to not have my seven-year-old freak out when the one-year-old dog gets excited and jumpy. Baloma W82. So the seven-year-old Apollo. kid freaks out when the dog gets That's excited. That's from Apollo's mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's one <laughs> okay, of her clients. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you um, go. So... I probably wouldn't be allowing that excitement to even kind of come up in the first place. Like I, if your dog is still super excitable and, um, jumping on your child, then I would have them either in place, um, in place in the crate or on a leash. Tethered, I would say. Yeah. 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 And then you can make it where that, that, um, exercise like you put it as like a drill that you do mm-hmm. like have like what we talked about at the beginning right, have right. your child run around or something like that mm-hmm. so i'll i'll read this one but i we cover the answer to this one already but just to kind of redirect the that this would apply as well um howdy i love your podcast i work at a doggy daycare part-time so i love listening to you guys while i'm in the yard if you guys are looking for more topics to show dogs and babies would be an amazing one this is I think this was an email probably, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, My brother and sister-in-law have a COVID puppy and she's a three-year-old doodle named Reese and she was the baby. Nine months ago, my precious nephew came into the world and um, let's just say Reese isn't thrilled about it. I like to say she loves her brother, but she doesn't like him. She by no means is aggressive, but has displayed behavior to show she cares about him. But there's definitely some jealousy there. She has growled around him multiple times, a low throat growl, definitely in a more of a warning way. And I've been trying to figure out how to get on top of it. Being around her dog cousin Mako and the baby seems to have helped her some. Obviously, we can't force her to like the baby, but um, I would love your opinion and resources on how to show her to respect the baby as part of the pack. Keep up the awesome work. Yeah. I mean, we, we definitely have already covered it. It's a matter of just asking for space. So Mm -hmm. making sure that you are setting your end goal is not that the dog and the baby have to be best friends, but the jealousy thing, I guess, makes me think what other resources are available to the dog. Mm -hmm. Um, on, there was another thing that she said that, um, triggered something in my brain, but I, I wonder if they're, cause dogs aren't jealous. It's a matter of claiming. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a matter of what the dog believes is theirs to begin with. So, mm-hmm. um, if there's that growling, I would send the dog away in the, especially if you know, you're holding the baby and the dog comes up and growls or somebody else is holding the baby, ask for space. Um, there was another thing that, that gave me a red flag, but I can't remember. Um, but yeah, I would look at overall, yeah, she says like she she's not aggressive, but displayed behavior to ask oh. for space, I guess. And and there seems to be some jealousy there. She also said that there was some sort of um, behaviors that indicated that the dog cared about the child. Yes. I don't care if the dog cares about the child. Right. Yeah. That's not my end goal. Like you, I kind of want them, the dog to not care about the child mm-hmm. before I want the dog to care about the child. I think it's like more so like we're treating the dog as the brother and you know, as the baby too, but like we just talked about the dog's the dog, the baby's the baby. We got, the dog is definitely part of the family. That's family member. But are we really trying to, um, have the dog show love and affection for the baby and be brother and sister, you know, like that's the baby and all of these examples as truly a 
piece of pepperoni pizza, right? <laughs> That's my goal is like, I want my dog to not care about the pepperoni pizza. Not yes. that I want my dog to love the pizza. I can't teach respect if I have a dog who cares so much about this thing. First goal is respect. And then ideally, yes, a, a bond, a relationship grows and, um, you know, they can go from there. But you also, why would a dog care about an infant? That's mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, why would they, and why would you mm -hmm. want them to? That's, that's your baby. The dog does not need to, and probably should not care about the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it goes back to all the stuff we talk about all the time, place, crate, you know, respecting boundaries. Um, this one says, and I think this would be a cool way to explain it just so we can put in like a small, it's like a short clip. How to explain to kids how dogs need boundaries so they can coexist peacefully. Um, this is from Rab's Adventuring. I always put it just in terms of what if it happened to you, you know, if you were mm -hmm. on the playground and somebody came up and they, um, they jumped all over you or, you know, you were sitting down on your chair and then somebody came and sat down on top of you, you wouldn't like that. So it's, you know, a matter of looking at, um, teaching kids how to look at their actions as a way that, um, affect the world around them and, and putting themselves in, in the dog's shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now this one too, the, the last question we'll get to, um, this one's kind of interesting. I know this is going to come with like, but, you know, but it's interesting to see their perspective and then you guys will have more questions behind this. My dog is around kids all day, but at night he growls at them and tries to protect them. It's every night around 8 to 9 p.m. and that he becomes a different dog and doesn't enjoy being around the kids anymore. I redirect him to his bed so he can have his own space and be quiet. Help. X Tina M T L L. <laughs> the first thing that kind of popped in my head is how old is the dog? Because if it's a puppy and usually when I hear that, oh, my dog gets really wild at night, it's a puppy that has not had any naps throughout mm. the day. Um, but okay. yeah, we call it the witching hour. <laughs> yeah. Just it like happens, kids, right? I mean, it really does happen. A lot of puppies at around eight or nine yeah. o'clock just go wild. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not just you. <laughs> and what, what other questions would you have? Like if it's a little bit of an older puppy or older dog? Um, I would ask if the kids are doing anything different at that time. Is that a time where, um, they're running around the house trying to get energy out? Um, is it a time where they're having like their before bedtime snack? Is there food around? Um, there's yeah, a lot of different things. It's a detective things. one. Yeah. And like how is the routine like? What's I going would on? look right. at in around eight or nine o'clock at night are you guys all sitting on the couch together? Because if you mm -hmm. are now throughout your day moving around and your dog isn't able to claim your space as much, but then now you have settled around eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, or maybe you started settling around seven, but now your dog's really settled in next mm -hmm. to you, then your dog is going to start claiming things, right? So the couch, you, things like that. But it could also be as simple as like, your dog's done for the day and would like to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Could be... You know, it's like more detective work, but yeah. it could be so simple. It could be more specific, but that's kind of how this works. Like you really have to look into the behavior. There's a lot more behind your dog's reactions than what you think there is. So. You just as a, as advice for this person, what, I mean, your, your kind of uh, catch all would be crating at eight o'clock mm -hmm. or crating at nine o'clock, like putting them up for the day. You could try place work around that time. But then if that is not working for you, then great. Just because right, that keeps yeah. everybody safer. Do you have, you look. yeah. One other piece of advice is make sure that's not the only time in the day that you're asking your dog to relax. Mm -hmm. Um, because if that is, they're going to have a way harder time. Um, especially if they've already been having issues at that time. Of that's night. a good way to look at it is if this is the only time of the day right. that your dog is behaving like this, what else is happening? in this moment that only happens at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all about routine, right? Yeah. I guess dogs Patterns. really pick up on that. Yeah. Well, I feel like we covered a lot in this episode today. Do you guys want to add anything else? No. no. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, any feedback, anything that you'd like to share with us, the best way to do it is by email info at thinklikeadogpodcast.com. If you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you can leave us a review that really helps our podcast and it helps us keep going. And don't forget, practice makes progress. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Think Like a Dog Podcast and follow at Mirror Image Canine for training tips. If you have any questions, please reach out to us via email at info at thinklikeadogpodcast.com.